Greetings, adventurous travelers and fellow keepers of the lake. So, Taroka, where do we start? Well, we start with Vistani, right? Uh, those are the, the nomads, the travelers of the Forgotten Realms. People that are flamboyant, dressing up in colorful clothes. And they are mostly in the Ravenloft setting. And they are using Taroka as their divination deck. Again, we're not going to go into the lore, into the meaning of the cards. Uh, that will all be provided in the description. I will also put in the description additional guides on reading the Taroka deck. There is much more material in, in terms of interacting with Taroka, especially in the setting of uh, Ravenloft. Yeah, it's more popular than Harrow, so I'll stay away from those topics as it is much better covered. For now, we will focus on the spreads, the mechanical part. Let's roll the intro and, and start the video. How does this compare to Tarot? Well, it also has like the major arcana, minor arcana uh, type of setup, but it doesn't map directly to Tarot. For example, only 14 cards are in the major arcana or what would be a major arcana in uh, Taroka. So the Ravenloft setting, it's from the 80s. It's from uh, Laura and Tracy Hickman and that's where uh, Taroka deck originates from. I won't go into the deep dive because I don't really know it, but there is an amazing source about Taroka and its history, usage, all that stuff in the description. Might as well get something from people more knowledgeable than this uh, hairy guy. This deck is based on a setting where the, the main like a uh, villain is a gothic vampire called uh, Strad von Zarovich, which kind of gives it this uh, dark theme in general. Right, so suits. Um, you have sword that is representing some like a fighting spirit, something strong, something uh, aggressive, violent, uh, like with the warriors. You have the stars, which are representing like the the, the power, the the otherworldly, uh, something like the desire to be uh, amongst the gods, for example. Coins basically represent like uh, material gains, a passion for lust, material wealth, uh, gluttony, obsessions in general, like things like that, things of like a sinish vibe, I guess. Whereas glyphs represent fate and like um, inner peace, spirituality, that sort of thing, like a paladin-esque vibe. And you see these also have like that stat-based vibes, similar to Haru, but it's a bit less, like they are compressed a bit. So for each suit you have like one uh, master card, let's call it like that, and you have uh, nine different cards representing nine different alignments. You can refer to them by their number or their name, doesn't really matter. Uh, one is chaotic good, two is lawful good, three is neutral good. Uh, you then have lawful neutral, true neutral, chaotic neutral, and neutral evil, lawful uh, evil, and chaotic evil. The ten in that order. The master of that suit, it is considered to have no alignment or have like um, all alignments, represent all alignments if that's what you're going for. Also, uh, each of the suits represents a certain animal, a certain element, and of course certain classes. So I will put it somewhere around here, uh, the table explaining like how they map out. Similar to Pathfinder, Vistani cannot uh, see their own future, so this is uh, the restriction they have. The high deck is most dominant. Uh, if you have a card from the high deck come out, that's the card through which you will interpret all other cards. If a Vistani is trying to find out a certain thing about a certain object or something, they will find the most representable card in the deck, take it out, and that is the subject of the reading. And it's called the focus card, so this is the, the roll card that you place in the middle of your spread and build stuff around it. If you're reading for a certain uh, character or an NPC, you would select the focus card uh, in relation to their class. Uh, again, uh, the, the table here that maps out the classes into their corresponding cards. In the Curse of Shroud, you have only one layout, and that is the cross. Of course, there are many more, and of course, I always encourage you to uh, make your own. Um, but here, let's go and see what the cross has to offer. In Harrow, we said that the cross is used to make up some form of a backstory. Here, it is used to, like give you a certain divination of the events that will unfold. And yeah, you can see it looks like this. 
This is the, the focus card. And as always, the first card is the subject of the reading, right? And now the second card, it refers to relevant detail of the past or uh, something that is important to the flow of the events. The third card refers to the present state of the subject. And from there, the fourth uh, represents the future action, like something that can be something that can bring uh, important results. And the fifth card refers to the actual result, something that will occur uh, if this flow is followed. There is another additional feature of this spread and that is that you can use it in a different way to gather information about the present state of a certain object or a subject. Let's go back to the table. Uh, the subject of the reading is the first card as always. The second card, it refers to something important from the past of the subject. The third one refers to the something that opposes the subject. It can indicate anything from an active enemy to a possible setback or any other bad thing that could happen to the subject. The fourth card refers to the possible futures for the subject. And it is always subject to like speculation as it is not the future in this sense is not written in stone. It is like one of the possible futures that can happen, right? And it generally refers to an impending threat or event, like rather than speaking of some specific outcome. The fifth card, well, it refers to something that is an ally or a friend or a boon towards the subject. So it is the opposite of four. Right, a reminder, be sure not to forget the alignment of the cards. They're not explicitly written on the cards, but they do exist. And you can like pull some inspiration from that as well. Or you can totally omit them if that's not your jam. Now. The extended cross. So the extended cross is basically the same as the regular cross but each card that is like the continuation of the array of cards it just emphasizes the card before it i won't go through all of the cards because there's like nine uh, additional cards so i'll just uh show it in the book and yeah you can pause and read this beautiful beautiful text I know the tower sounds epic as a spread and goddamn does it look epic like look at this let's let's go to the table look how epic this looks and it's also called the divergent cross mm, even better like so cool this one is used uh, when one is examining multiple possible futures uh, that are derived from some multiple past events the first five cards have the same meaning as the basic cross but the tower is only used with the information gathering aspect of the cross it gathers information from context and then spreads out like multiple possible outcomes and, and pasts and all that six seven and eight uh cards six seven and eight they represent the past and they should be uh, looked together to provide a complete like uh, complex uh, picture of the past and we haven't seen uh, this mechanic of grouping cards like this up until now so interesting thing when we look at 9 10 and 11 these cards represent possible divergent futures so these three are not grouped they are looked as individual cards and these are more like possible outcomes not like future events and there's a distinction between those two uh, one thing that's really just you see that you can do is include death or something very very bad as one of the possible outcomes just to just to keep the players on their toes yeah the, the last one is the pyramid it is basically an advanced form of the flow of events uh, type of reading of the cross the regular cross so it basically represents like events that are happening and all uh, con converging to like one singular outcome for this one we will have to consult the book because there is more than 10 cards and i'm not gonna read it out loud only because i'm not sure if like people are listening to these videos or like watching usually when i listen to the video i like everything to be said when i'm uh, watching it i like things to be on the screen if that makes sense yeah leave a comment say what you prefer and we'll do it like that in the future So if you watched my last video, you know that there is a mechanic of like misalignment in the cards in Hero. Well, you can do a similar thing here as well. Take half of the cards, uh, rotate them and pick what the up direction is uh, from the point of view of the viewer. If any of these cards come up as like rotated, that would mean you would interpret them in like the opposite way. In regards to classes and, and like playable things, I have been doing some digging, but I haven't found like specific classes i know there is like a taroka master homebrew class 
I'll put a link in the description, you can check that out. I'm not really sure, like, uh, leave a comment if you know if there's any, like, homebrew classes or even, like, officially, even better, officially created classes that use the Taroka deck as their main, like, uh, source of magic or spell touch attacks or something like that, I don't know. So, yeah, uh, I know this wasn't really a deep dive, but, hey, I'm not very knowledgeable on Taroka. I didn't want to exclude it from this playlist. I think at least I could, like, provide you with some materials, some, like, uh, point at some sources that are better than mine while still providing like the minimum you would need to like do the reading and as I said in the last video like don't be afraid to invent your own invent your own meaning for the cards invent your own spreads uh, play around with it it's like what more would you like than to have the freedom to invent like your own deeper symbols and meanings as the dungeon master so hope you like this one the next one is gonna be juicy it will be system agnostic we would focus on like different types of intuitive readings different schools of thought when it comes to reading cards of any divination decks there is also a very interesting theory that i found online which i want to share with you and all in all it will help you to create uh, interesting fortune tellers readers customize them and improvise the reading on the spot what i'm trying to say is there is a method to the madness here and if you like this type of content please please subscribe join the order of the barlow keep like share whatever suits you and as always keep on going keep on loving keep being creative play more dnd and i will see you in the next one. Farewell, Keeper.